Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Our program will begin in just a moment. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Our program will begin in just a moment. Good day and welcome to Advocacy Anywhere, powered by American Jewish Committee. Advocacy Anywhere is AJC's digital platform that enables you to engage with AJC's global expertise, content, and advocacy from wherever you are. We are delighted to bring to you today the first program in AJC's new six-part series titled A Life in the Trenches, an oral history with AJC CEO David Harris. Today, David, in conversation with AJC Chief of Staff of the CEO, Julian Laskowitz, will share his personal Jewish journey and what inspired him to take on this lifelong mission. A lifelong Jewish activist, David has led AJC since 1990, referred to the late Israeli President Shimon Peres as the foreign minister of the Jewish people. He's been honored by more than 20 times by foreign governments for his international work, making him the most decorated American Jewish organizational leader in US history. After we hear from David and Jillian, time permitting, we will take your questions. You may email your question to questions at AJC.org. That's questions plural or use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Jillian, I turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Daniel, and welcome to our global audience. David, it's a true privilege to be a part of this new oral history series on your lifetime of global Jewish advocacy. And as always, it's great to be with you today. Julian, it's my pleasure to share the story with you. So let's get started because I know there's a lot to cover. Since this session is focused on the beginning of your Jewish journey, I know that very much begins with your own family history. So can you start us off by giving us an overview of your family's own history, their Jewish journeys, and how this all affected your own upbringing? That could take the full hour, Julian. Um, so I, I, I was um, raised on the Upper West Side of um, Manhattan. 123 West 74th Street was where we lived from age one in my case. Um, my mother actually lived there long after I left for college. Uh, the Upper West Side was the home of, of my extended family. Um, we lived in apartment 6B. My maternal grandparents lived in apartment 6C. And I'd love to come back to what that meant for my, 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 my upbringing, my Jewish upbringing um, a bit later. Uh, my, my one aunt and uncle lived seven blocks away. Uh, my paternal grandparents lived a few more blocks away, and then there were uh, various cousins and great uncles. We all lived in this sort of enclave on the Upper West Side, essentially between 72nd Street and 96th Street, between Central Park West and Riverside Drive. Um, that was, those were the boundaries of my life, basically, for, for many, many years. Uh, and it was a very Jewish neighborhood in some respects. I mean, there were also other subcultures there, uh, principally Italian, Puerto Rican, and um, it wasn't then called LGBTQ, but the Upper West Side was sort of in the forefront of that movement as well. Um, but I found within that space, um, a, an ethnically, religiously, culturally, and I dare say tribally, a very strong Jewish neighborhood, which in many ways reinforced my identity pretty much every step of the way. Uh, my, my, my family was not religious. Uh, we did not have a mezuzah on the door. Uh, we never celebrated Shabbat. In fact, I did not experience my first Shabbat dinner until after I finished graduate school. Uh, and uh, um, my father knew very little about the Jewish holidays and probably cared less. So in the classic sense, not going to Jewish day school, not going to Jewish summer camp, uh, it's hard in, in, in the year 2022 to understand what were the feeders that sort of created my identity. And obviously when I was younger, I didn't fully appreciate them anyway. Now, as I look back, I understood that Number one, uh, my family was nonetheless very comfortable in their own skin as Jews, especially my mother and her parents. My mother was an extraordinarily proud Jew. She was also, um, as someone is called, no, uh, a survivor of the Holocaust, as was my father, 
and were, as were all the people in my family older than myself, they all had stories. With few exceptions, um, thankfully, miraculously, they all survived. Um, but, but my mother especially never wanted to let go, uh, nor did her parents. And that had a great impact on me. My grandparents lived next door, as I said. And when people talk today about what, what, are, the, what are the best methods for nurturing identity in Jewish children, my first answer is Jewish grandparenting. Uh, I was blessed, extraordinarily blessed. I saw my grandparents every day. Uh, and while my parents were busy sort of getting on with life and, and, and working, and doing all of the sort of daily things that parents have to do. My grandparents had a kind of longer view. Uh, they transmitted a lot to me just in the daily interaction. It wasn't indoctrination. Uh, there were the stories, the stories of Russia, where they came from, the stories of France, um, where they landed after they, they, they left Russia, uh, then coming to America. Uh, there was the fact that my grandfather received the uh, the forward newspaper in Yiddish every morning at the door. Uh, so I associated being Jewish with family. I associated with stories. Uh, I associated with pride. Uh, I associated with Israel because some members of my family from Europe ended up in Israel and stayed in Israel. So there was just this natural connection to where my family was. And then again, it was walking on the streets of the Upper West Side. You know, I, I look back and I, I call it my accented neighborhood. When I was growing up, there was a very European Jewish subculture. Uh, most people on this call would, would not necessarily know the references, but the number of stores, uh, food stores, cafes, um, other stores, um, which had a kind of Jewish um, environment. I, I remember very much going to synagogue with my mother it was really twice a year, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and taking such pride in walking back and forth on Broadway and counting the number of stores that were closed for the Jewish holidays. And the number of other Jewish families, you know, by the way, they were dressed up for the occasion, sort of walking back and forth. It was easy to be a Jew on the Upper West Side, and it was a source of pride. Thanks, David. And I, I know at a certain point, I think it was in the seventh grade, your family had to make a large de decision about moving from the Upper West Side to Germany, which I'm sure wasn't an easy decision given your parents' background as Holocaust survivors. Um, so you moved to Germany, and I know that was a really formative year for you. So can you talk to us a little bit about that experience and that transition as a Jewish family? It was the it was, um, beginning of what would have been seventh grade. And my father, Eric Harris, um, was an engineer at CBS. And he had been involved with some of their innovative technology at the time. This takes us back to 1960. So that was the introduction of, of video replay, things we take for granted, for example, in watching sports today uh, and special effects. And CBS signed a contract with a large German television network uh, and uh, was asked to provide this new technology. And my father was the logical person to be asked to go to Germany. What CBS did not know at the time was that my father was a survivor who had absolutely no interest in ever, ever setting foot in Germany again. Remember, in 1960, the stories of the survivors were largely not known. Uh, they were not being told. And frankly, even if they had been told, there were not many people listening. It's a very different time than today. But my father was faced with this dilemma. His employer had asked him to go um, to work in Germany. Um, and he wasn't sure that he could refuse. On the other hand, how could he go? And I remember the late night discussions that my mother and father had in the next um, room when they thought I was asleep. Uh, can we go? Should we go? Is it the responsible thing? Is it not? And ultimately, uh, my father decided to go for a trial period. And if he could manage it emotionally, we would follow. And if not, CBS would let him return. And that's exactly what happened, Jillian. Um, 
he went, I think, in August of 1960, maybe early September. And I remember a few weeks later, my mother picking up the telephone. In those days, there was the rotary telephone. Uh, and there were things like person-to-person -person calls and collect calls. And she said, yes, I accept the charges. And um, I heard her say, we'll start packing. And um, so here we are, 15 years after the Holocaust. I'm just turning 11 years old. Uh, and I'm off to Germany um, to live in Germany with two Holocaust survivors who swore that they would never want to see Germany, hear German, even though it was my father's native language. And we arrived in Munich and I started the seventh class. And on the one hand, um, it was a perfectly normal existence. I, I was a child, for goodness sakes. What interested me at the time? Um, sports stamp collecting, uh, fun food, uh, skiing, adventure, and all of that was possible, all available. It was new, it, it was fun to take a street tram to school. Never done that before in New York. On the other hand, there was something completely abnormal about the experience. In uh, the early weeks that we were there, we were in a hotel before we found an apartment. And I learned the next morning from my mother that my father thought he heard Nazi era songs being sung in the beer hall on the floor just below us. And my father, the fighter, and my father was a fighter during the Second World War, French Foreign Legion, OSS, escapee from a Vichy prison camp, you name it. My father did it with a, a, bullet, a, a bullet wound in his ankle to show for it all his life. My father apparently went downstairs at two o'clock in the morning to confront those singers of the Nazi era songs by himself. I remember when we were together at the main train station uh, one weekend, I don't know where we were going. My father saw a poster uh, to, to visit Dachau for the day, but not Dachau, the prison camp, but Dachau, the lovely village. And my mother had to practically physically restrain my father from trying to grab the poster and ripping it off the wall, saying, Eric, you're gonna be arrested for this. And, and he's saying, but how can they talk about Dachau as anything other than what it became? Uh, during a Hanukkah, uh, even though we were not a religious family, my mother made a special point of putting the Hanukkah in the window, facing outward. And she told me afterwards of some of the snide comments and. And, 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 and ugly looks that she and we got because we had publicly identified ourselves as Jews in Germany 15 years after the war. So, you know, here I was trying to process sports and, <laughs> and stamp collecting and, as I said, fun foods. Uh, and on the other hand, I began to understand something bigger was going on here. Uh, wrapping, wrapping myself around it at age 11, was not a simple or obvious process. But as I look back now, it was the beginning of something else. And maybe the fact that, <laughs> to fast forward, I became so interested in German-Jewish relations and AJC became the chosen vehicle for that, might in some way have been linked to, um, uh, to that year in Munich uh, on Einmillerstrasse in a neighborhood called Schwabing. And being there 15 years after the war with two um, Holocaust surviving parents who had sworn they would never um, go to Germany. David, would you also link this year in Munich to your decision to devote your career to Jewish advocacy? You've mentioned that your family wasn't religious or observant, but they were very much survivors and fighters. And that was very much ingrained in your family. So I know it wasn't a synagogue or Shabbat, as you said, you didn't have a Shabbat dinner until later in life. What was it exactly that drew you to this, this career? No, I, I think it would, be, um, it would be disingenuous to say that I came back in 1961 after a year in Germany and, um, and made a resolution that I would now devote the rest of my life to the Jewish world, not at all. So I came back and I went to eighth grade <laughs> um, and life in New York resumed and um, life in Germany receded. And without you know, social media platforms and all, I couldn't stay in touch easily with friends I had made and, and we did not go back. 
uh, to visit again. Um, in my case, I didn't go back to Germany for many, many years. But other things happened along the way, Jillian. Again, one by one, there was no, if I can use the word epiphany in this Jewish conversation, there was no single epiphany. I remember about age 14, um, hearing about the book Exodus by Leon Uris. Uh, and I, I, I was a reader in any case, I love to read. And I um, remember picking up the book and I sat in the armchair in our living room one evening, it was a school night, and I did not get up from that armchair until I had finished the book the next morning. Now, anyone who knows me know, knows I needed a lot of sleep. You know, I, 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 an all-nighter was not something in me, but I was so gripped by this book, um, every word on every page just jumped out and talked to me. And I became consumed, com completely consumed um, by this um, extraordinary story told by the Honduras. Then I read Miller 18 uh, about the Warsaw Ghetto, again by Leon Uris. Um, and then later, I remember um, uh, in graduate school, another book that really hit me between the eyes and began to kind of change my, my, my overall direction. It's a book by um, a gentleman, um, Arthur Morse, called While Six Million Died. And it was a book essentially about um, US administration policy during the Second World War toward Jewish refugees. And basically how scandalous so much of that policy was. Um, now understand at the end of the day, um, most of my family came from the United States. My mother during the war, in fact, she was one of 14 members of my family that were able to get very rare US visas during the war, largely because of a congressman, Ivor Fenton from Northeastern Pennsylvania, who took an interest in our family. So for me, the American piece of the story had always been a very positive one. And then I read this book and I realized, wait a second, my family's experience was extraordinarily unusual. The norm was rather um, turning a blind eye um, rejecting the, rep the passengers on the, of the SS St. Louis, who were off the coast of Florida, who could see the skyline of Miami, but who were not permitted to disembark and find refuge in the United States. Um, the larger story was the 1943 Bermuda Conference, which the US and the UK held together, ostensibly to address the refugee problem, but ultimately was essentially a, a charade that did not address the, the refugee problem, much less even mention Jews by name. Um, so that was the story he told people like Breckenridge Long, uh, the Assistant Secretary of State um, in Washington, who also turned his back on Jews for a whole host of, 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 of reasons. Um, that began to open my eyes. Brilliant. And then, you know, after reading several books along these lines, I took my first trip to Israel. And there, I think, I also had another awakening, um, a big awakening. So David, I'm glad you mentioned Israel because going hand in hand with your Jewish identity is your connection to Israel. So can you talk to us a bit about that visit and what Israel meant for, for you and your family growing up and sort of how did that connection intensify or, or evolve throughout your formative years? It, it, it evolved first because of, of family. I, mean, I knew um, long before I ever visited Israel that um, some of our family, our family had all been in France. Uh, they had all sort of migrated to France from basically from the Soviet Union as they could escape Stalin. And they all kind of regrouped in, um, in Paris. Uh, and when the war broke out, a number of members of the family tried to make their way south, uh, hoping eventually to cross the Pyrenees into Spain and Portugal, but to do so needed an American visa. And it took 17 months before the visas that I mentioned earlier, um, with the help of Congressman Fenton came through. So for 17 months, a big part of, of my mother's family uh, were in hiding or, or, or fleeing. My father took 
a different course because he was sent to the French Foreign Legion in Algeria by the French. Um, he was arrested by Vichy after France fell in June of, of 1940. He spent three years in Knazza, which was a French Vichy labor camp um, in, I believe, Western Algeria, uh, in the coal mine area. It was, it was hard, laborious, dangerous work under very difficult conditions, all the more so because he was a Jew. Um, he escaped, and after he joined OSS, the U.S. Wartime Espionage Agency, uh, and parachuted behind enemy lines, OSS brought him to the United States at the end of the war. His parents, my, my paternal grandfather, uh, ended up first in China, um, having fled east, and eventually came to the United States. My paternal grandmother ended up as a cook in the Soviet Army. Uh, and eventually after the war made it to Australia. Uh, and then by a vote of two to one, my, my father <laughs> and his father uh, voted for her to come to the US. Uh, she voted for her to stay in Australia and for them to come to her, but she was outvoted. Um, and then another part of my family stayed in France and fought in the French resistance, the French Jewish resistance. Most notable among them was Mila Racine, um, who, um, whose job it was to smuggle Jewish children from Haute Savoie, uh, that, that's in southeastern France, across the border into Switzerland. Uh, she smuggled over 230 children successfully, safely. Uh, she was caught in 1943. Uh, she was taken to Anmas, to the Gestapo headquarters. Uh, she was tortured. Uh, she was then deported uh, to Ravensbrück and then to Mauthausen, and she was killed about six weeks before the war's end. The other members of that part of our family stayed in France, were also in the resistance, and after the war um, moved to Israel. They were Zionists, uh, and they helped create and build the state of Israel. So for me, Israel was not a political expression first, nor a religious expression first. It was family connection. Later, even if I was an infrequent synagogue goer, I, I understood it was abundantly evident that one could not talk about being Jewish without an understanding that there is a connection between a people and a land, just as there is a connection between a people and a faith. And it's not just any land, of course, it's a very specific land. Um, and then um, I, I traveled to Israel, I, I was 21 years old, um, and I, 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 I was surprised by my own reaction even before we landed. I, I looked out the window, I had a, a window seat, and you know, we were approaching the coast uh, of Tel Aviv, and I, I, I think the tears began to flow. Uh, it, it, it caught me by surprise. Uh, I, somehow when I landed and got into the bus, go to the youth hostel, wherever I was staying. Um, I just began to marvel at every car, every building, every tree, every road, that, you know, that th this, was, this was Israel. And, and, and it, it spoke to me, it cried out to me. Um, and I saw young people, many of them wearing army uniforms, young men and young women. I was coming from, a, from this country where um, there was, uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, so much um, anger, so much division, um, so much opposition to the Vietnam War, such a national malaise, if I can call it. And then I come to Israel, and it's three, four years after the Six Day War, and here I see these young people <laughs> who, at least superficially, look and act totally differently than the young people I left behind um, uh, back home and, and on the college campus. And I, I was just caught up in, in the whole thing. And then perhaps most poignant for me was um, being on a bus in Haifa, I think it was. It was a crowded bus and I was standing. I was holding on to the railing and the man next to me was doing the same. And it was summer and he was wearing a short sleeve shirt. And um, he had a tattoo but not the 21st century tattoos that uh, are all the craze. 
he had a Nazi vintage numbered tattoo. Now, I come from that world. Um, so it was not the first time I had seen it, nor the second time. But it was the first time I saw it in Israel. And I found myself staring at him uh, and asking myself, what, what, what does it mean for this gentleman? I'm guessing he was maybe 40, 50 years old. What does it mean for him, a survivor of the Shoah, to be living as a free citizen in a Jewish majority state with an army to defend that state and knowing that wherever it was that he was arrested, denounced, detained, deported, tortured, uh, whether it was coming from who knows, Belgium, the Netherlands, Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, uh, Greece, who knows, there was no Israel. There was no Israel then um, to perhaps save him, to offer him refuge at a time when, as we discussed, few if any countries were prepared to offer a haven to fleeing Jews. And if there was, if there was a single moment, that was it. That was it. Seeing that man staring at the number on his forearm, looking around me and realizing he, a free citizen of Israel, could never have imagined this. But there he was. And if I had to encapsulate what Israel meant, it was in that unexpected encounter. By the way, no words were exchanged. Um, I didn't ask him anything. I didn't think it was appropriate. But words were not necessary. I mean, here I am 50 years later talking about the story as if it were yesterday and feeling the same emotion. So Israel for me is not just another country, Billion. Um, um, for me, Israel is both the realization of an ancient dream and prayer and yearning. And Israel is at the same time um, a modern realization that Jews um, must have self-determination, must have sovereignty on some sliver of land, and must have the ability to control our own destiny. Now, this, of course, gets us very quickly for some into politics and conflict. And I, you know, I never saw it that way. I never saw it as, um, as a zero-sum game where if Israel exists, a Palestinian state could not exist. That, for me, was not the issue. I, I was never opposed to a Palestinian state um, as my, my thinking evolved, as long as the state was there to live alongside Israel in peace and not as a stepping stone to replace Israel. Um, but I feel blessed beyond words by my sort of crude arithmetic, roughly 75 generations of Jews beginning in the year 70 in the common era, prayed, prayed, for Israel next year in Jerusalem and did not live to see it. And in my time on earth, I've lived to see it. And I feel sad for those Jews. And I'm sure like all of you, I know some personally for whom Israel has no meaning, um, no connection um, or even worse, is a source of some embarrassment um, or shame. I feel badly for them. They're missing out on arguably the most exciting moment in modern Jewish history, the rebirth of the state of Israel. It, a permanent work in progress, uh, a, a country that yes, has its flaws and its shortcomings, which country doesn't, including our own here in the United States. But what an exciting journey, and I'm happy to be a small part of it. Absolutely, David. And, and around this time, this moment that you described in your first visit to Israel, I know you were on college campus at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what was your Jewish experience like on campus at that time? And I also know you went abroad for graduate school um, to the London School of Economics. So also, was it different in the, in the UK? Was it different abroad as opposed to your experience on campus in the US? <laughs> 
So yes, I went to Penn. Um, it, it had a fairly large Jewish um, population. By the way, uh, in those days, you know, you had to think twice when applying to college, uh, which colleges were more or less um, open to Jewish applicants. It wasn't just about qualifications. Um, uh, there were some schools that I might have wanted to apply to that I, I'd been told were really not quite that friendly. Um, tried to keep the Jewish population down. Um, and even those Jews who came tended to try and sort of hide their Jewish identity because you know, it, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't particularly uh, welcome. So Penn was a very comfortable place for me. Um, I joke that I went to Hillel twice in my five years at Penn, the first time and the last time. Um, and that was because um, when I went there, it seemed to be a very comfortable place for self-identified Orthodox Jews, for Jews who, who wanted a, a kosher dining room. And I was neither Orthodox nor was I kosher. And I, I didn't quite find the, the space for me at the time there. Maybe I didn't look hard enough. I know things have changed. So I can't say that I had any particular Jewish life on campus. Most of my friends were Jewish. If you're involved in politics, it was mostly around the Vietnam War or the civil rights struggle or local campus issues. I was always very proud. It's, it's again, the same story. You know, a number of people in those years, Jillian, a um, number of Jews in those years, you know, had self-doubts. This was a time when, when a number of Jews began looking for you know, other religions, um, other belief systems, um, other communities, other sources of spirituality. Uh, and uh, in my case, none of, the, none of the above. I was perfectly happy being Jewish. I was proud to be Jewish. Like some, I was you know, acutely conscious of who in the world was, was and was not Jewish, or you know, who did I want to ask, were you Jewish or not? But that was about it. Um, but then, uh, later in my years at Penn, uh, I was asked to be one of four undergraduate students joined by a graduate student who would serve on the search committee for the next president of the University of Pennsylvania. If I recall, there were seven trustees, six faculty members, and five students. The first time they'd ever asked students uh, to participate, and I was one of those five. And we went through about 18 months of deliberations. I mean, this is a big job, serious university. Um, and then we, we came to our um, consensus conclusion. Uh, and the gentleman's name was Martin Meyerson. And at the time he was the president of SUNY Buffalo. And lo and behold, a discussion ensued, which again, I had not seen coming. He was Jewish. No president of the University of Pennsylvania since its founding by Benjamin Franklin in 1740 had ever been Jewish. In fact, I was told that no president of any Ivy League university, going back to King's College, Columbia, had ever been Jewish until that time. So the fact that Martin Meyerson was Jewish became very material to the discussion. In the end, to the credit of, of the university, it went forward, Martin Meyerson came, fine president, and more or less at the same time, Dartmouth College, which traditionally was not known as quite as friendly towards Jews as say Penn, um, chose John Kemeny, who if I remember was a Hungarian born mathematician, also Jewish. And suddenly the floodgates opened in the Ivy League from zero for 300 years to two within the span of months. And now I think no one gives a second thought because it's become so, so normalized, thankfully, uh, in the Ivy League. Um, and elsewhere. Then, as you say, I went to the London School of Economics. I, you know, I joke because, again, I found many Jews there that became my friends, and we euphemistically called it the London School of Economics. But, but even so, the, the atmosphere was different. Uh, at Penn, I don't recall any political issues regarding Israel at the time. Things like BDS were unheard of, totally. Protests, unheard of. Then we get to LSE, a little different, um, more politicized, um, 
more divided. By the way, that continued to evolve after I left to the point where some of you may have seen that the current Israeli ambassador to the UK, Tsipi Hotaveli, was giving a speech um, at LSE, I think just a couple of months ago. And she was chased out of the school and harassed in front of the school. Um, police and security guards had to sort of get her into a car and get her, get her away. Uh, the university and others uh, subsequently apologized to her. But I just had a little bit of a foretaste of that feeling. I, I don't want to say it was the same, but you can begin to feel that LSC was a more politicized and I would say in some respects radicalized campus then than Penn was um, in those years. Right, and, and we've seen that time and time again where, where trends that start in Europe make its way over to the States. So that's just one example. Um, David, I've also heard you talk um, about a series of events after graduation, after college that changed your career aspirations from American or UN diplomacy to Jewish diplomatic work, which you are now in. So can you talk to us a little bit about that shift and the specific events at that time that, that led to this change? It's true, as, as I look back on it now, again, I didn't fully understand it while I was living through it. But I think for me, the, the, the years 1971 to 1974, five, were absolutely critical in, in pivoting me away from what I had thought would be my ambition to be um, uh, an American diplomat. I very modestly thought of, thought of myself one day as the US ambassador to Moscow uh, or a, um, um, an international civil servant a diplomat working for a United Nations specialized agency or uh, for uh, the International Committee on Migration. I mean, that, that was the space I, I saw, that, that was the space I, I probed uh, I, I had a few interviews um, in the case of the US State Department. I sort of came to realize that maybe we'll get to this later. Um, I was too politically independent um, to work for any US government, any US administration. You know, I, I visited the State Department to meet some, some lower level people that agreed to see me. And I saw the pictures on the wall of the President of the United States and the Vice President of the United States. And I wasn't sure that I wanted to work in an office environment where I had to put up the pictures and perhaps every four or eight years had to change the pictures. Again, I, 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 I wanted to be my own person. I loved America. Uh, I wanted to help America, but I couldn't see myself in this role. And I also vividly remember one um, informal interview with the UN specialized agency that I was interested in. Uh, and again, this goes back to the early 1970s, where the person was kind enough to take time to meet me. But after we spoke for, 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 for perhaps an hour, he said to me, look, David, let me be honest with you, because no one else will be honest with you. You've got three or four strikes against you, so it's not even worth trying. You're an American. Um, you're Jewish. You're male and you're white. And some combination of those four factors Will probably derail your application process. At a higher level, governments can push through their favorite candidates, but at entry level, you know, in, in, in the early 70s, these factors were very important. You know, in UN politics and assignments of jobs, it was all about numbers and, and country origin and all the rest. Um, so what happened to me um, along the way? Well, in 1971, or thereabouts, I began to become aware of what, what was known as the Soviet Jewry movement. Now, again, my own family, my mother is born in Moscow. My mother and her parents next door spoke Russian. I spoke Russian. I learned Russian at home. I spent four years studying Russian in high school. I, I, I spoke Russian, I, I studied Russian in college. Um, and it, it resonated. This was essentially my family, I thought, but a generation or two later. And I heard the words, at pustin narod moy, uh, in Russian, shalach et ami, in Hebrew, let my people go. 
Uh, and again, I, I found that it touched me. Uh, and I felt I needed to respond. I, I had often thought about that kind of um, useless question. What would I, I have done if I were a 16 or 18 year old um, and were living through the Holocaust? What, what would I have done? Um, would, I, would I have gone quietly, passively? Would I have fought? Would I have had the courage? Could I have survived in the woods as a partisan? Uh, what would I have done? But of course, ultimately, would never know the answer. What I discovered in the Soviet Jewry movement was that that was, for me, the test of my generation. Not what I think I might have done if I were born in Krakow, Poland, um, uh, and the Nazis occupied my country. But here we were in 1971. Let my people go was the cry from Moscow and from Leningrad and from Kiev and from Tashkent and from Tbilisi and from Baku uh, and from Chernovsi and from Tallinn and from Riga. Um, and somehow I thought they were also talking to me. In 1972, the next year, I watched um, the Summer Olympics. I was a big sports fan, I mentioned it in relation to Germany. I had these, um, <laughs> these fantasies of being an Olympic athlete and walking into the stadium in the, in the opening uh, program, proudly following the American flag. Um, but of course, that was only in my own mind. And then I saw, on the one hand, the great pride in Mark Spitz, uh, who won a number of gold medals as a, as a swimmer. On the other hand, the 11 Israelis, athletes and coaches who were murdered. And there too, there was, a, there, was a, there was a big moment. They were murdered. That was tragic enough. But what happened next was no less tragic. Um, for many in the world, it was an inconvenience to the grandeur of the Olympic Games. And this kind of, this fanciful notion of you know, the world stops its politics for two or three weeks and comes together in sisterhood and brotherhood to celebrate sport. Um, baloney. Um, and um, the reaction of the International Olympic Committee was, in my mind, nothing short of shameful. The fact that there was this indifference to the plight of, of 11 murdered Israelis, um, and all the more so on German soil, uh, just, uh, just clung to me. Um, and um, the same year I joined um, an international organization, but an NGO, not a UN or US organization. It was called AFS, the American Field Service. It's a great organization. It focused on, on intercultural programs, on, on introducing children from around the world to other cultures, other families, other, other school systems at the senior high school level. Um, and it was great, except for one thing. I discovered in my two years there that Israel was not part of the program. Dozens of other countries were, including several Arab countries. Good, great. And this became my first Jewish advocacy initiative. On my own, you know, as a newbie, um, the bottom of the ladder, I just sort of gently began asking questions. Why is Israel not part of the program? Shouldn't it be? All the more so here in New York, for me, the most Jewish of Jewish cities outside of Israel, how could this be? And I began to hear stories which, frankly, to me, sounded like a runaround. Um, you know, make this guy, David Harris, go away with these bothersome questions about why Israel's not part of the program. And in my two years there, I was not successful in getting Israel to be part of the program. Later on, I heard it did become part of the program, but it was my belief that Israel fell victim to the Arab boycott. That basically Arab countries were saying then, 1972, you want our participation, um, Israel cannot be part of it. So it's either Israel or it's us, but it's not gonna be both. Again, it's a far cry from 50 years later where countries like Jordan and Morocco are at peace with Israel, 
then 50 years ago, they were part of the AFS program. Israel was not. In 1973, um, I was in synagogue with my mother, again, the twice a year synagogue at B'nai Jeshurun on the west side of Manhattan. And all of a sudden during the prayers, there was this murmur. And then the rabbi, um, I believe it was Rabbi, um, the legendary Israel Goldstein, or perhaps it was William Berkowitz, um, went to the Bima and said, ladies and gentlemen, um, Israel has just been attacked by Egyptian and Syrian forces on the holiest day of the Jewish year in Yom Kippur. And again, I found that more than I might have expected, uh, this, just, this just penetrated me from head to toe. I found myself shortly afterwards um, picking up the phone and calling the Israeli consulate. I didn't know anyone, didn't know who to speak to, what to say. And I simply said, um, you need a volunteer. Um, and, <laughs> and here I have to take some, uh, some credit for Israel's victory um, in the uh, Yom Kippur War, which was, as, as many know, a protracted war and a war in which Israel lost too many um, fallen soldiers. Uh, and the reason I can take some credit is because the um, Israeli government rejected me. I can only shudder to think had they accepted me and I had gone to Israel with my very limited military and other skills, exactly what I would have done. But here I had a lifetime lesson in Jewish advocacy. So my first foray was at AFS and trying to get Israel off the boycott list, but that was me. Um, here in 73, I asked myself if I can't go to Israel. Um, and by the way, the actual reason they rejected me, I learned later, was because I was the only child. And, and Israel had a rule that you know, only surviving sons would be treated differently. I, I was both the only surviving son and the only son. Um, but if not, what could I do? In 73, the fear was that Israel might not survive. It was a far cry from six years earlier of the miraculous redemptive victory of the Six Day War. And I realized again, you know, who was I? I was, I was, I was just a, a lowly um, staff member of, of, of the American Field Service. But all eyes turned to Richard Nixon, the President of the United States. Why? Because Israel could not have anticipated such a long protracted war. And in order to wage that war, Israel needed additional weapon systems and spare parts. And who would make that decision in the one country in the world that would actually consider responding to the Israeli request, the United States? Well, it was none other than Richard Nixon. The same Richard Nixon that was reviled and despised by so many, especially young people on campuses and elsewhere, the same Richard Nixon who had been involved with Watergate, um, and the same Richard Nixon that came from a party that very few people, very few Jews at the time supported, the Republican Party. So here for me was um, a great dilemma. Again, <laughs> I'm speaking at a very, at, at a very street level. Uh, gee, if we can't reach Richard Nixon, in order to help persuade him to make the right decision and provide those needed weapons, then what happens to the state of Israel? And that may be the moment when I became a nonpartisan. Again, it was not a, a declaration. Uh, there was no Twitter in any case to announce it, but that's when I began to understand, wait a second, whatever my personal politics might be in an American context, if the fate of Israel hangs in the balance and the decision from the United States depends on the person sitting in the Oval Office, whether or not I voted for him or her, um, I've got to figure out a way to lead my own life such that there can be a pathway to the Oval Office and a pathway to the powers that be in the US Congress both houses, both sides of the aisle. Otherwise, what? <laughs>
And then subsequently I learned, same for Soviet Jewry, as the movement built momentum and the US role in responding to the cries from, from the USSR was, was essential. Would the US respond? Would the president of the day respond? Would the leaders of Congress respond irrespective of their party? For me, these issues were so overpowering. The future of Israel, uh, the liberation of Jews from the Soviet Union, that I wanted to figure out what role could I play over time. And for myself, I realized that if I really wanted to play a role and be serious about it, then I had to find a nonpartisan way of doing it that, was, that would allow me access and entry and, and credibility, if you will. Um, in 1974, at the end of my two years at AFS, I was um, invited to go to the Soviet Union, of all places. I was one of six Americans. I spoke Russian, um, uh, and they invited me to go and teach in the Soviet Union in a US-Soviet exchange program that was one of the early fruits of what was called detente an effort by Richard Nixon and Leonid Brezhnev, the Soviet leader, to kind of calm things down in the Cold War. So I was one of the six. I, I, I went first to Moscow. I taught in school number 45. Later, I went to Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, and taught in school number 185. And there, there, in the Soviet Union, in the, in the middle of the Cold War, there, I started going to the synagogue. <laughs> what, what I didn't do in New York, though so there was a synagogue on every street corner on the west side, uh, I began to do in Moscow, where there was one synagogue on a heap of a street. And I began going every Saturday morning, frankly, more outside than inside, because that's where Jews gathered. Uh, and I wanted to be with them. And, and David, I know um, a future session, we're going to focus on the Soviet Jewry movement, which is such an important case study for Jewish advocacy. Um, and I know we have to switch to viewer questions soon. So one more for you, because you mentioned um, nonpartisanship and centrism, which has really been a highlight and, and a focus of your career. Um, you mentioned the context at the time and why you decided um, to become nonpartisan. Was it at all difficult? And what were some other factors that contributed to that? Right, so putting this all together now, Jillian, um, I did become a nonpartisan and I've remained a nonpartisan uh, to the point where my late and beloved mother Nellie, until she died three years ago, um, begged me to tell her who I voted for in, in various elections or to advise her or guide her. And I wouldn't uh, because I, I felt it was so important to, to my work uh, in advocacy at AJC, to my credibility, to the organization's credibility, to, to be above partisan and electoral politics. And that's the way I've been. So I've tried to understand why. Well, I offered one explanation, the 1973 Yom Kippur War, but I realized that it, it didn't come out of the blue there either. First, my family is a very unusual family. In, in the case of, of my parents alone, um, they, were, they were confronted both by communism and by fascism. So I had an innate, inbred hatred, fear, and suspicion of both extremes. Um, both extremes, not one, both. And that kind of positioned me in between. Then I saw, for example, even during my campus days, uh, and I was part of the anti-war movement, but you know, a small cog in the wheel and very moderate. And I saw people like Jane Fonda going to North Korea. And I saw some of the activists burning the American flag. And to me, this was as repugnant as the idea of the war was. So I found myself once again, between, betwixt and between. I, I, was not a, I was not a supporter of the war. I wasn't a gung-ho advocate for the war. On the other hand, I wasn't prepared to laud the, the North Korean Communist Party. And I wasn't prepared to, to stomp on the American flag, heaven forbid. So once again, I found myself in between. Thirdly, going back to high school, and if I could wave a magic wand 
every American high school would have debating, not as an extracurricular activity alongside soccer or glee club, but as a, a required part of the curriculum. I was an active, energetic debater for years. And in debating, as some will know, you're assigned both a topic and a side. So I had to, to learn in the course of my career as a debater, there can be more than one legitimate, rational, reasonable way of looking at things. And even if you disagreed fundamentally at the end of the day with the other side, you could, you could see that there were arguments that could be for, for many compelling. And I often had to make those arguments if I was assigned you know, the negative as opposed to the affirmative. So I began to see there was more than one way of looking at things. And finally, in my own Upper West Side coming full circle, you know, we did not live in the doorman fancy buildings of Central Park West and West End Avenue and Riverside Drive and 72nd Street and 79th Street and 86th Street. We lived on a very dangerous block um, and without a doorman. And the issue of crime was real. And much as we were all um, liberal in our outlook on social policy and lots of things, um, as a child, the number of times that I was afraid, afraid to come home at night, afraid to enter the hallway, afraid of who might be lurking in the elevator and attack me or, or mug my mother, again, put me in a centrist position because all it seemed to me all those people in the luxury buildings with safety were all focused much more on <laughs> the criminal than the victim. Like, I, of course, I'm generalizing. I understand that. But then again, I, I, I realized, wait a second, there's something wrong here. Um, so what I'm saying to you, Jillian, is in a variety of ways, I realize that I'm neither here nor here. Sometimes I may be here. Sometimes I may be here. But the most important thing is not to become a political um, robot, not to put on an ideological uniform and then salute the doctrine of that uniform. And again, I know we'll return to it, but what attracted me over time to AJC was my belief that this organization was not putting on an ideological uniform and was not saluting um, a dogma or doctrine. I wanted to find a home once I determined in those early, those decisive years of the 70s, which we just spoke about, um, and, and my realization after my Soviet experience that I, I, I wanted to pursue Jewish advocacy. Um, I needed a home which did not have pictures on the wall. Uh, it had an independence of spirit and character, a nonpartisan um, approach that said, uh, at the end of the day, we're here not to advance a, a particular party. We're here to advance the well-being of the Jewish people. We're here to protect Jews in danger. We're here to support the U.S.-Israel relationship. We're here to stand shoulder to shoulder with the state of Israel. And as a result, those will be our starting points intellectually. And not, not what does the Republican Party tell me should be my view, or what does the Democratic Party tell me, tell me should be my view, or what do liberals or conservatives think needs to be um, the ideology of the day? So that's how it all began. Those are some great lessons learned then that can absolutely be applied to the situation today. And I know we're, we're heading towards the near the end of the hour. Um, so Daniel, maybe we can include some questions from the audience, a quick lightning round. Or David, in, in the minute we have remaining, I'll, I'll, give, I'll bundle these two questions together. Um, because there are actually several people that have uh, similar questions. So the first question from Samuel Myers in Milwaukee, hindsight's always 2020. Looking back on your 30 plus year history with AJC, what advice would you give your younger self at the beginning of your journey? And then from Tal Schneidman in Tel Aviv, you spoke movingly about what motivated you to get involved in AJC and Israel advocacy. 30 plus years later, what continues to motivate you? First of all, allow me um not only to thank the questioners, but also to correct them. Uh, I joined AJC in 1979. I actually joined the Jewish world in 1975 after my experience in the Soviet Union. So my Jewish advocacy journey is now 47 years long. And my AJC journey is now in its 43rd year. 
30 of which of actually 31 plus now as, as CEO. Um, my advice, I, all I can say is, uh, I often ask myself along the way, beginning at an early stage, um, what's the purpose of life? Or what's the meaning of life? You know, these big towering questions. And I came to understand that the purpose of life um, is a life of purpose. Uh, and um, so I, I, I would urge younger people who are thinking about their future, um, find your inner passion. Um, in my case, I've tried to describe to you how my inner passion emerged and evolved. Um, I hope that there will be some other young people on this call for whom this may resonate. But in order to create a life of meaning, a life of purpose, find your inner passion. Don't be strictly transactional about it. Um, and once you find that inner passion, um, go for it. Don't be deterred. Unfortunately, we live in a world today with a very short attention span and a desire for instant gratification. I viewed the, um, the Jewish journey as a relay race. Um, for me, it's now been 47 years and a journey that began nearly 4,000 years ago. So I'm roughly just over 1% of that journey. Uh, the Pfizer vaccine has not yet been found um, to protect the Jews, to protect Israel, to fight anti-Semitism. So the journey goes on and here is the baton. And I'm more than happy to pass it to the younger people on this call. Um, it's a journey that is well worth pursuing and a journey that will provide both meaning and purpose for you, I hope, as it has for me. David, as always, thank you so much for your willingness to share this personal Jewish journey and in, in such an inspiring way. Um, to our viewers, if you enjoyed this session, there's more where this came from, where we dive deeper into some of the topics that David mentioned today. Um, so Daniel, I'd like to, to turn it back to you. But, but remember, Jillian, the baton is going to you as well. I gladly accept. Thank you, David and Jillian. And thank you to our global audience for joining us. And as David just said, for those of you who share this passion for Israel and Jewish advocacy, I'd encourage you to visit AJC.org to learn more about ways to get involved. And please mark your calendars for Thursday, February 17th for part two of this six part series, where David will talk about what sets AJC apart from other Jewish organizations and how AJC has evolved since he joined its ranks. You won't want to miss it. Thank you again, everyone, and goodbye.